Lily and the rusty raconteur, their first day out in the city of Neverwinter, and hopefully less eventful than the night before. While it's still light out, Lily wants to visit some of the merchants here in the city. She's heard there was an entire street of bookshops, scribes, and bookbinders near the House of Knowledge, a Temple of Ogma. Of those, the most famous is Moscato's Maps and Legends Bookshop, specializing in maps, records, and tales of the North, including, as Lily noted, treasure. But she has no idea where the House of Knowledge even is, let alone Moscato's. Lily warned Sharwin about the guard dog with the plague-ridden nose in front of the shiny knight arms and armor. She heard the owner is a mage, a master of metal reshaping spells. Whether it's true or not is yet to be seen, as is whether this dog will live to see another day. This half-orc is no master of metal reshaping spells. He doesn't even look like a mage. Hello? Alright, this is Durga. Hello there, then. What can the shiny knight arms do for someone so obviously well taken care of? Yeah, I think she assumed that he worked here, if not owned it. I'm just a merchant. What does he want me to say? I think she's curious if he's heard any rumors or anything odd. I don't have time for rumors. I guard the shop from looters and plague sick. That's all that matters. Alright. Of course, she's not looking for anything in particular, but... She is interested in quality, that's for sure. Hmm. Not sure what you're after, really. My stock is the best you'll find for honest coin. Of course, it's not like you'd really know. I mean, I might have a special store of things for a true finey woman, but you ain't one. <laughs> yeah, hardly sounds like a salesman. Well, I guess you're right. Merrick doesn't like selling premium items to people he's not sure know how to take care of them, but business is business. Take this wardstone. I'll get you into the back room. There's where Merrick makes the good stuff. He'll take care of you. Alright, so <laughs> apparently then we're going to be looking at the bad stuff. They would likely be disguised and could be anywhere. Durga carries one of those curious staghorned helmets. Three days ride north of Waterdeep, along the Long Road, there's a small farming village named Amphel, named for one of Waterdeep's early warlords, Amphel the Just, who had a keep there. As you enter town, there's a cozy timber and stone building called the Staghorned Flagon, the only watering hole in Amphel. The locals simply call it the Stag and Flag. It's named for an ancient and battered drinking cup, a warrior's helm of unknown origin, with two antlers affixed to it that hangs over the bar. Anyway, the only reason Lily even remembers hearing the place is because they offer a local vintage known as mushroom wine she's always wanted to try. An acquired taste, she's heard, but supposedly even better than Alirath from Undermountain. She wonders if they serve it in a staghorned helmet, and if they do, if she can request it in a toll glass instead. A wardstone for the back room. Maybe Merrick is a mage after all. Who might want to commission a dagger or a short bow or maybe even a long sword? Not that she'd likely ever use it, but Inquisitor General Black might be more readily identified as an official of the city if she hung a sword at her hip like the rest of the guard. And given her importance, a long one would certainly be more fitting. Not one of those short swords that every lackey of Lord Nasher seems to favor. Even Arabeth. Certainly not a mage. Not even a shirt. The stifling heat is no excuse for unprofessionalism. Hello there! <laughs> Alright, here is Marek. Well now, you might know your way around a fine weapon or two, huh? What can Marek do for you? <laughs> Alright, asking what it is exactly that he makes here. I'm a weapon and armor smith of sorts. I take component items and combine them with magic items to make even more powerful magic items. Not a bad little gig if you can get it. If you want, I can look through your backpack to see if you have anything I can combine into a powerful weapon or a suit of armor. Is there anything in particular you want me to look for? 
Yeah, she's not quite that interested in weapons. Unless maybe, oh, well, a dagger or a short bow, maybe even a longsword. Asking what these components might be. Well, I need stuff like adamantine and ironwood and diamonds and dragon blood and fairy dust spitting on the ground. Probably narrowly missing Lily's boot. <laughs> and holy water and gargoyle skulls and adamantine. Yeah, I think she'd like an example. Uh, I suppose. I don't like tipping my hand all that much, but I can't sell it if you don't know about it. Here, take a copy of this book. It's got all you need to know. Well, it's convenient. Alright, ask her where she might get, well, dragon's blood or fairy dust. <laughs> that not sound very common. That ain't my concern. If you're the adventuring sort, you can go try and take them from monsters. <laughs> I think you can get some from merchants, though. Alright. Yeah, what kind of guarantee does a work have? Uh, no guarantee. If your weapon or armor is really powerful already, <laughs> you should just keep it. I can't guarantee that your fancy item won't get worse. <laughs> That's what kind of guarantee is that? Okay. Oh, well, he did give her a list. I think she'll ask... Well... Outright about some of these more rare items. Of course! Not everybody's into axes, swords, and maces now, are they? Let me give you a list of the exotic weapons I can make. Hmm. You don't seem to have the items I need. <laughs> All right. Recipes of the Forge sadly doesn't include any for daggers. There are, however, two that stand out. One is for a copy of the Ravager Halberd, the weapon Lily recovered at Yagashura's lair in the Marchy Mountains. She still has no desire to own one. Another is for an Astral Blade, a longsword. That could well be the ceremonial weapon of choice for Inquisitor General Black. Otherwise, a profit might be had on some of the others, provided she finds the required components. Marrick of the Hammer, the spitting shirtless smith, Lily's horrified to realize she's standing in the middle of a sea of brown, viscous dwarf spittle, each little puddle on the verge of bubbling in the overwhelming heat. Her stomach starts to turn as she hastens for the door. Sharwin wants to visit the mute loot here in the city, just to browse, of course, as the instruments start at 900 coin. The shop is octagonal in shape with cedar shingles built around an old oak tree. It serves as the loot maker's home as well, where he actually lives with the tree's dryad. But Lily doesn't believe they'll have the time. If they did, they'd be going to Danner's Mechanical Marvel's specialty shop instead, where they sell gnomish lantana and dwarven clockwork wonders. Those are things to look at, not loots. Some abandoned supplies atop a landing. Earlier, Lily didn't want to be mistaken for a beggar, but it's dark and now she's got little red to fish things out of crates or barrels for her. They find a bottle of sleuth. There couldn't possibly be a worse wine, which is probably why it's been left here, even in the quarantine. It's a dry, sparkling white for the House of Good Spirits Winery in Waterdeep, which also serves as the headquarters for the Vintners, Distillers, and Brewers Guild of the city. At two coppers a bottle, you don't bother ordering it by the glass. Whether it's even an improvement over Elminster's choice is questionable. Lily continues to educate the Black Lake Bard on the wonders from Lantern that you might find at Danner's Mechanical Marvels, ensuring her that Body Not Glinkle is not one of them. Self-striking wind-up push-button flint boxes or Electrum jewelry boxes inlaid with pearl sporting animated adornments such as tiny clockwork dragons that chase their tails around a central pop-up vanity mirror. Sadly, the only traitor they'll have time for before visiting the Cloak Tower is this curious elf. 
It may even be the druid Luna Lanaro mentioned, looking to free zoo animals from Blackleg or some other such ridiculous plot. Greetings. Blessings of the Earth Mother Shontia and the Tree Father Sylvanus upon you. I am Nyatar, in the service of nature. Or obviously a fellow elf. I think she's curious who he is and if he provides any services. I welcome your well-mannered address. Ask what you will, and I shall respond as I am able. And ask him what he does. I see to it that the city does not tip too far from balance. That concerns for natural elements are kept a priority. It's not easy in these times. You would not understand. Only a sister in nature could fully appreciate what needs to be done. How vital my task is. <laughs> Of course, she has no interest in helping anyway. Asking if he sells any supplies. They would likely be disguised and could be anywhere. And possibly as a pair of black leather boots of hardiness. Nyatar explains that they've been commissioned by Awil, the Archdruid of the Neverwinter Woods Druid Grove himself. The Archdruid was looking for a pair of comfortable boots that would serve him well in the wood and in combat, as well as alleviate his need for armor. Hardy boots that require a hardy purse as well. So far, Lily has eyed five pairs at a cost of close to 15,000 coin. After buying spells, she can't imagine how she'll afford even the first pair. She may have to forego adding to her permanent collection and simply be content leasing candidates just long enough to tell whether they're in fact her old worn out boots. Finally, the Cloak Tower. Home to the many-starred cloak, Mage's Gill, the real power in the city. The many-starred cloak, or simply the cloak, is probably one of the few reasons the Arcane Brotherhood of Luskin hasn't conquered Neverwinter already. Not only do they support Lord Nasher with combined spell weaving, but they construct blast globes for the city militia, glass spheres that burst on impact when thrown. The cloak boasts over a dozen members, including Ophala Chelderstorn of the Moonstone Mask, and is led by Altora Sarptil, who we see here. Her clothes are impeccable, as though they repel the very dust in the air. Well, hello. I had heard there was a new magic adept in service to the city. The Guild of the Many-Starred Cloak welcomes you. Of course, this is Altora Sarptil. Yeah, Lily. Little... I'd like to ask about the guild. I should think it would be obvious. Within this tower is Stuart Neverwinter's collected experience with the art and discipline of magic. We are the many-starred cloak, and it's our goal to bring each student of magic to the heights of their potential. We'll provide access to our magical inventories as well as free passage throughout the cloak tower. Asking Lily if she'd like to become part of the guild. Of course you would, just for the prestige. I'm glad to hear that, but before you can join the guild, you have to be able to show competence in several important areas of ability. For your first test, I need you to demonstrate to me that you can find knowledge on your own, and then apply it for unrelated requests. To help you out, I'll tell you where to start. Find me the following four items. Once you've done so, bring them to me. The four items that you must find are a bit of clay, a flask of water, a puff of fog, and a bit of kindling wood. Mark well the order. It's interesting. The items may be found in the arcane laboratories of the many-starred cloak located throughout the city. The buildings are marked with sundials. Take this key. Beware, as the laboratories are guarded against would-be initiates Return to me when you have the four items. Sounds simple enough. While well, not sure what she meant by Mark Wild the Order, Lily did notice that each item seemed to be related somehow to one of the four elements. Clay to earth, flask to water, fog to air, and kindling to fire. She also wonders if the sundials are significant, either prescribing a particular time of day or perhaps the order itself. Hello again. Are you back to continue on with our next round of challenges, or did you have something else in mind? 
Yeah, I think we'll like to see what they have. Or what the guild has to offer. Lily browses longingly through the many stored cloak stores, and it's not even the secret stock available to only members yet. Choice robes like a black and red battle robe designed by Claffin48 to encourage youthful and unscrupulous mages to challenge the older generation. A brown adventurer's robe designed by the famed wizard and adventurer Vayner de Hast, former royal magician to King Azun IV of Cormir himself. And elemental robes, both acid and electric. That would almost complete her set. Unsurprisingly though, the only wizard's robe she has is purple with olive trim. Must be in fashion this season or something. And of course, a reminder that they would likely be disguised and could be anywhere. This time, possibly as another pair of red leather boots, the ones blessed by priests of Chanticleer. And spells. Showy ones like grease and web. Sneaky ones like invisibility and, of course, a spell to see invisibility. Dehabilitating ones like darkness, blindness, and deafness. Ghoul touch? Why not? Cat's grace? Surely his mistress doesn't need it since she has bones already. A pair of dispels, lesser and normal. Magic circle against alignment for protecting herself against demons or the evil twins of Tear. Fireball. Even though she has a red robe, Bones is probably glad she doesn't know that one yet. And if she did, hopefully she'll get protection from elements as well. And you can't buy haste without also buying slow. No less than 15 that Lily is looking to acquire. She'll wait until she's a member, however, to ensure the best possible price. And she even offers a ring of clear thought that might give Lily a little mental boost, as it were. It's said to have been created by priests from the Song of the Morning in Barragost. Apparently, a local young man was tormented by voices in his head, and he begged the priests of Lathander to kill him. They crafted the ring, and it did indeed clear his thoughts, but the voices remained, and he eventually took his own life anyway. Funny, she doesn't remember Kelda Thormill mentioning the story. Among the treasures known to reside within the meeting place and citadel of the many sword cloak is a wondrous magical device recovered from a Netherese rune, Halivar's Universal Pantograph. It's said to be so large as to take up the entire room in which it resides. It reputedly can make two coins from one or other copies of metal items. The cloak members claim to be careful to duplicate only a few things on occasions of great necessity. Right. And that they have no idea if the pantograph's magic is limited and could be depleted after a time. Needless to say, Lily would love to have even only a few minutes with the machine. Altura did mention free passage throughout the cloak tower as a benefit of membership.